we're going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Welcome to today's Shack Committee. It is Friday, May 24th, and like I said, it is 9.01 a.m. We usually meet in the afternoon, so let's see how everybody does today. Um, so uh, we got coffee. Okay, so welcome, everybody. Uh, you know me. I'm going to start with attendance like a good teacher, so here we go. Um, Michelle Marker, that's me. I'm present. Mark Schauer. Here. Casey Pyle. Present. Dwayne Hargis. Here. Leela. Here. Here. Okay. Dr. Baggerman. He might come on later. We'll see. Dr. Woods. I know. Julie Dye. Here. I saw Julie come in. Lisa McKenna. Aaron Pryor. Here. Araceli Moreno. Well, I do believe we still have um, quorum, so we are good to go in the quorum realm. So there you go. All right. Um, everyone was mailed the minutes this past week when we got our agenda and such. And so I just wanted to go through and see if there were any um, corrections to the minutes before we vote on accepting those possibly. <laughs> were there any questions? I'll change your attendance, don't worry. <laughs> Any questions on the minutes? All right, then may I have a motion to approve? I'll make a motion. All right, Casey, thank you. A second? Thank you, Leela. All right, any discussion? Awesome, so if you guys will either yay, nay, or abstention, or it sounds weird, abstention. Or abstain. abstain. It says abstention. So I, I know, it. but it's weird. All right, so I approve. Yay, Mark. Yay. Casey. Yay. Mr. Hargis. Yay. Leela. Yay. Uh, absent. Absent. Julie. Yay. Lisa. Yay. Yay. Aaron. Yay. Yay. And Arcelli absent. All right, so motion approved. See, this meeting's like flowing right along. So that would be our consent item. Uh, we're now going to move to our informational items, which is the triennial, that's a nice word, a triennial <laughs> assessment with the fitness gram. And so Miss Amy Bull will be presenting. And I just want to point out in your packets, in your folders, um, you have the um, triennial assessment summary along with the well sat that Ms. Poole will be reviewing this morning. I do not have that in mine. Here you go, you can have mine. There's an extra. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure the slides for this. They should be on your desktop. Uh, on the desktop, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. I can't see them. Oh, what? Okay. So while we're waiting, um, Shaq, just to kind of locate the two documents, you have one, it's um, identified as the Local Wellness Policy Triennial Assessment Survey. It looks like a Word document that has tables on it on the front with our names. Um, and then you have almost like an Excel document that has some shading and colors on it. So these are the documents uh, that will, uh, that Ms. Will will be going through uh, along with her PowerPoint to guide us through.
what's the What's the route to get there? Do we sign off? Do you give some bullet points and just what needs to be added? We sign off and it goes to the superintendent? <laughs> Good question. Uh, so to back us up, we're required by state law to do a triennial assessment, right? So that is this kind of Word document here. And this triennial assessment is to gauge the strength of our policies around health and nutrition within our schools. And so... Um, in order to standardize or calibrate our critique of our own policy, because some people may be skewed to say, yeah, our policy is great, it's wonderful. We are required to use an instrument to measure the um, effectiveness of our policy and the comprehensive nature of our policy. And there's a couple of listed instruments and the district has always chosen the WellSAT. Um, and so using this rubric and these set of criterion we laid this next to our actual board policy and then scored zero, one, or two for each of the criteria. On the yellow ones is what's missing, as Ms. Bull had said, or really doesn't give enough information as to how we're complying with these aspects. And so our policy, we have sent it to our local service center in addition to looked at other school districts like us to see what their policy, their school board policy says, and we align with them. Like the goals are generally the same. We could address this by operationalizing our policy because policy isn't necessarily operationalized. It's just the rules whenever we're building the operations and that's what we don't have. And so uh, Ms. Bull and I, after she had completed this process along with the subcommittee, um, came to me. I said, well, we can operationalize this. Just for example, the keeping the confidentiality of students. It's operationalized every day at lunch because students can type in their own student ID number. And so that tells um, the person at the register whether the student owes money or if that lunch is credited because maybe they're free or reduced. And so we keep the confidentiality that way. If a student is too young to type in their number or maybe they have um, an impairment that recalling their number is difficult, then they tell the, the person at the register what their name is and then the, per that, the employee will type in that student's code for them. But that's the operational side. We don't put that in our policy. And so that's how we could fix this, is create an operational guide on how we are implementing our um, wellness policy. And that gets approved at the local level through our superintendent's executive team. And that includes the superintendent, the deputy superintendents, our attorney also is a part of that. And so uh, we would work with them to make sure, uh, along with Ms. Uh, Boyd, to make sure that our operations are accurate. And then that would fix this, kind of these highlighted areas and bring up the scores. So you don't have to buy anything. It's all personal working on. Right. I was curious about, some of the twos are even highlighted. So I was curious about that. Absolutely. And this is, it's an internal, this is like I said, an internal document. Um, and, but even our twos are going to be operationalized. Like they, they would go into the plan, even though we have it in our policy. Like when you're building an operation, you don't leave out steps just because it's located, say, in a policy. So it, it doesn't mean that it would be excluded. But yeah, the, 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 the highlighting kind of doesn't match the, the, the defined purpose of highlighting. So uh, I have a question. So the comprehensive score of 77, I mean, in my world of 
credits and transcripts. I get a credit for that class. But what really is the target? Yeah, I passed. So really, what is the target? You know, what what is there a recommended either through WellSat or it's not you? So we don't test our athletes in ninth grade? We do, yes. Because I know some of my kids were talking about it a few weeks ago. They were all talking about their, their, their I got this in my mile. So I'm just yes. like, that's a huge decline between eight yes. and nine. I'm like, yes, it is. it's not this, good. This is across, I mean, it's not just CCISD where you're doing some So even though our numbers include all those athletics, it still declines that much. Well, I should
like your students who did it two weeks ago. kids this represents sure. or anything but maybe like now that all the data is in I'm, I would be curious because that number is like my freshmen need to start running more May I ask a question? So what is the data for aerobic capacity? Is it their heart rate during the mile? Is yeah, it it's their VO2 max VO. estimated through the mile time or the pacer test. It's a it's a VO2 max. VO volume. The volume of oxygen. oxygen. Yeah. Maximally consumed. Max. Yep. I used to run the VO2 max lab. Yes. Yeah, so, because um, I had another profession before I came into education. Uh, so, anyway, it is, we're using time essentially, and that time um, will help us estimate a student's VO2 max. So, it's not as clinically accurate as putting a mask on and measuring the oxygen exchange. But it's it's the best we have for public school, and so it's the time it's to do a mile. Yes, it's and and the pacer test as well. Time for pacer there test. Are formulas yes. I, I, before this program, I used to calculate it by hand. I get it for the students and There's math formulas that you can calculate estimated VO2 max just from the mile time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> exactly. So this is this is good information. So do we do something with it? I mean, do we do we implement things that will make them more fit? I mean, what is what is it we can do with this information other than to let us know, all right, our aerobic capacity is 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 going down. Is there a way in your data collection you can separate like the athlete, the athletic ones from the PE? Because I would think that's what the school board and everyone would want to see. They're not just going to, but they've had hard data to show there's a difference between, you know, seventh and eighth. And here's one of the reasons why we don't have the, you know, the, and then like maybe at Ray even splitting, like they had two years, what were their numbers like? But I mean, we have students that are in athletics for four years because they're doing 
football or volleyball or whatever ball. I mean, you know, they're doing all the things. They're running. They're distracting. Um, but what I'm saying is we have those kids, but then we have kids that are, it's PE, like strictly PE. And we need to, like, see what the difference is. So it would, it would be good. So we want it, and we're going to get it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, and also the information that we've done with this, uh, Mr. Hargis, going back to your question, is our HOPE Symposium that we had in January, the focus was on healthy living and lifestyle. Um, and we had many more community organizations that offer very low cost, free in some sort situations, like um, activities uh, in personal time. Like we had yoga there, martial arts. We, ha we had several. I don't remember them all. Uh, but that's why, I mean, we are trying to introduce that to our families so that they become aware of the services that are available. Um, during the summertime, Generally, I haven't heard it announced yet, but I haven't been, my kids are out of high school, so I stopped listening. But, you know, if you're in the 415 um, zip code, you get free summer type activities and services through the city, you know. And so it's making sure that we're advertising to our families so that they take advantage of these. Um, I don't know that, I don't know how successful we'll be in battling the gaming hobbies that have been picked up. You know, but that's why we're trying to expose our families and our students to other fun activities outside of school. Um, in school, it is what Ms. Bull said about let's help to ensure that our classroom settings are creating uh, rigorous activity that's getting the heart rate up and, and strengthening lungs, but trying to find a passion in uh, being active adults you know, wanting to continue outside of, of high school. And um, I, I know we haven't found that yet, you know, uh, but that is something to, to the lure and alternatives, like pickleball. I mean, my very young children, I say they're young adults, they're 20, in their 20s, um, have picked up pickleball, and pickleball was meant for, like, us folks. <laughs> Um, you know, but they've picked it up, and so that's great, you know, trying to encourage. Um, but that also tells us is that that's a more, you know, low intensity. It's, you know, not hard hitting or as hard on the body as some other, like what we do in school, like running and jumping, you know, it's hard on the body. And so just introducing and encouraging. So these, every coach is required to do this just once a year for this, each student. So, like, I mean... growth or that's what I was going to suggest. Yes. Kind of like all the reading tests they do first week of school, do it again the last week of school, see if they've had growth and And then education, if they're poor, have to have poor scores at the beginning of the year, let's, let's try to how can they have tips on how to improve because and try to improve by the end so <laughs> I was like, <laughs> wait, yeah. I'm supposed to be getting faster? <laughs> Yeah. 
Goal setting, absolutely. We work mm -hmm. goal setting activities into our instruction guide as well. Mm -hmm. Is there an alternate way of measuring the VO2 max for students who may not be able to do a PACER test or a mile for injury or for impairment of some sort? Well, and that's what I was about to say yeah. in school settings. I don't know that we have one. Thank you so much. You're doing an amazing job. Thank you. All right. All right. So we are going to move forward with our program updates and our subcommittees. And we're starting with character ed, mental health, Ms. Courtney Rios. Hey, good morning, everyone. We met uh, for the mental health character ed subcommittee on uh, th this last time on May the 6th at 2 p.m. We met via Teams, and it, the people who were in who were in attendance were myself and Miss Pryor, and we had a vendor that was requesting to present some information to us um, for student support. And so I asked them to first present to us uh, so we could, you know, vet the, vet the information. Um, and so I wanted to bring this to you guys today just to share with you kind of the direction that a lot of companies are starting to move into to uh, support student mental health. Uh, so, the, so the owner of this company uh, is Scott Freshett, and uh, he presented to us on the Alongside app. Alongside is a web and mobile app developed by clinicians that provides 24-7 mental health support to secondary students. Uh, features include an AI chatbot, and they call it the Llama. There's a Llama. It's really cute. Um, what was his, his kiki, ki, kiwi, kiwi, kiwi the llama. And, um, and, and, and the chatbot is evidence-based clinical exercises that are given to students. Uh, activities to calm and reflect and learn and es escalation of suicidal ideation and severe issues. Um, what, the, what the product does is any type of severe situations that come up that the students are typing in, they um, will notify whoever's the contact in the, in the app. Um, and data to support responsive counseling. Alongside helps schools cover everyday needs of all students. So it's a tier one, you know, search product for all students and frees up staff to adequately support more severe issues. Um, so alongside is built by doctoral clinicians and teens. And so we had some next steps, um, you know, from our meeting, but it, it went well and it was very interesting to see kind of how technology is starting to um, be built in AI world to, um, to address student, students' mental health needs. So one of my next steps was contacting to districts that are currently using it. And the, the product is rather new. It's a couple of years old, I believe. And uh, Ed Couch Elsa is using this product and uh, Irving ISD. 
So I had a, a meeting with Irving, Irving ISD, and um, she stated that they use this program for four of their middle schools uh, with great success. She stated that the students use the program on the, either their phones or, the, or a Chromebook, and it helps with the counselors with that frequent flyer, um, you know, type of situation that we see a lot of the time in middle schools. Uh, they take, they can take it home, use it from home, and um, the program alerts counselors and administrators um, when emergencies occur. So I, I, we're still in the process of talking through, you know, these options, but I wanted to bring it to you guys um, through my subcommittee report just to give you guys an idea of some of the things that are out there for our students um, that could help and benefit them. So um, it was very interesting. Um, Ms. Pryor was on, and I don't know if you want to share anything. Yeah, I was very impressed. Um, I think they put a lot of energy and effort into developing a really like user-friendly product. And one of the things I really like about it is that I do see students utilizing a tool like this when they're not comfortable going to a person. Yeah. Um, so I think it could be a really good like line of defense for us to alert us to potential um, threats or crises that we may not have known about until yeah. it was too late. So yeah. I think it's a really good tool. And that's one thing that she was saying, the Irving um, administrator was saying is that they've caught a lot of it, like situations with middle school because those kids that never come to us and that never bring up you know things and they get on this this llama it's called the llama and um, and they're able to you know kind of I'm having a bad day and then the llama the AI comes back and you know they kind of talk through it and then the program is also set up where it, it bases the theme of the student's conversation, and it gives them themed videos and materials to be able to use for calming strategies and you know whatever the theme of what the students talk so about. So how is it judged that it's, I mean, this lady here at Irving says it's a game changer, so how mm -hmm. do you know it's a game? What information do you get from yes. So that they, lets you know it's actually doing something? So they, they have seen a significant decrease in the amount of kids that are coming into the counselor's offices, okay. frequent flyers. She said that they've seen a decrease in um, the, the amount of suicidal ideations and you know the self-harming reports. Um, so, so it was, it was interesting um, that they. That she definitely has seen a decrease from last year to this year, and she mentioned that to us as well. What, what about like um, misbehavior or aggressive behavior? Like, have they seen any improvement in bullying situations, or you know, the mutual combat? You right. know, two people she, have a conflict with each other, and I don't recall her talking about the bullying and the conflict. I don't, do you remember her talking about bullying? No, I don't remember no. that being specific. And, and that's something that, like I said, we're just bringing it to the forefront to start having these conversations, knowing that AI is here, the kids are, you know, getting into different ways of getting information. Um, and and um, so that's something that we can definitely look into further, you know, if we ever want to pursue anything like this. What's the parent's role in this program? That's a good question. So the parents, there is an option with the pro this product um, for parents to opt out. And it's very, very, very easy to do. You call the company and you give them the names and they disable the, um, the sign-in for those students. And so where is this app? So is the app located on their personal device or on a school device? Both. In in Irving, it's both. They can use the phone and then they can use the Chromebook too. Um, and so it's automatically, so I'm thinking Canvas. about a Chromebook mm -hmm. because I would think if it's on my personal phone, I would have to download, download the, app. the app. So mm -hmm. is, what does opt out look like for that? Yeah. Um, well, their sign in, their sign in is disabled. Because they have to download the app, but they have to still sign in. Okay, but on a Chromebook, I could see at the district, it could mm -hmm. be pushed out to all Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. Like students would not be able to download the app. Right. And so um, that's where so the opt-in is disabling the disabled login for login. that application. Yep. 
I, that's my understanding. Like I said, this is all new. Or No. no, it's a single. So as a district, I'm assuming the way that it works, like for all of our apps, it's a single sign on. The district assigns you a login, and that's all the student has to log into our mm -hmm. devices and our programs. So if if through the opt out we're disabling, that would prevent the, the student's district login. Mm -hmm. Now, could they log in with their friends? I mean, I guess. I know students do a lot of sharing of information. Um, but Leela's agreeing with you. <laughs> And, and, um, but, and, but anyway, that's, that's what I envision about like a district device and we pushing it out yeah. and by disabling it, it's their yeah. single, like it's the same sign on for textbooks, you know, same sign on for uh, computers that, I mean, not computers, uh, but like calculators available on the computers, like it's a district assigned login. Yeah. And so Ed Couch Elsa, um, they started at the middle school too, and they, they I believe it was... This year, they decided to expand it. They did middle school last year, and they expanded to high school this year. So um, when I saw this product, I was like, okay, this is, you know, new, lots of vetting and, you know. Um, but we did send out student uh, needs assessments for spring for the counselors that I've mentioned several times. And one of the questions that we added on there is, would you be interested in having a mental health app to you know, learn about calming strategies. And I want to say it was about 65% of middle school said yes. So, I mean, it's something, it's worth thinking about, I think. It's worth uh, looking into, um, you know, just different products that are coming out. But we want to make sure that, you know, we're vetting thoroughly um, through information for our students to have. So, so if it is a district created logon, like our single logon, what data or what analytics will the district get from this? Because if a middle schooler, like you're saying, well, all those reports went down, mm -hmm. okay, but does the district still know that those kids are having these crisis crises, situations? Yeah. And are the counselors still involved with them because I don't want an AI just handling all the mm -hmm. business. So Definitely. how does that work for the, in the, from the district perspective? So I so know yes. that he's got like the back end and I haven't, I mean, like I said, we just mm -hmm. started having conversations. So um, I know on the back end, the counselors that have their like school campus, they can see like certain information and, the, and it does run reports. More in depth with that, I would probably have to have him come or show this product maybe to you guys on his end because I, I barely know what the llama's name is. Yeah. So, but I'm worried about that part of it. Yeah. If the kids yeah. are saying all kinds of things to an AI, but we have no right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it does have like it has it starts the chat with the student giving them the limits of confidentiality. So it's telling them from the get go. If, if you say these things, if you talk about these things, we're gonna have to alert someone. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing I thought was neat is that they do have a group of teens that are working with them. So, that, cause like, I don't know the lingo, I don't know the acronyms, I don't know the things that they're saying, yeah. but these kids do. And so they build that into the AI. So if they're like using some acronym for kill someone or threaten someone or uh -huh. something or drugs or whatever, it's gonna no. alert um, because those acronyms are, are yeah. known. By they're ever changing yeah. robot they're ever changing well yeah i'm just i i know we've had enough meetings with public comment that they're going to say well then you're just opening this up and some yeah. robots yeah. talking to my kid and, and what does that mean i don't mean? see it and, as a replacement yeah. for a counselor right. i see would, it yeah. as a blanket of protection right yeah. but like it's it's a way for us to reach more students who might not feel comfortable asking for help um, to a person, like, or they don't know who to go to, or they don't feel comfortable going, but they're very comfortable with the device. They're they're used to communicating in that kind of way. And and it's a, and that's a great point. I'm glad that you brought that up about the different little uh, acronyms that the kids say, because he has built that into in as well. Um, the, I, I think that the the idea behind this from just talking to the other districts is it's not repl definitely not replacing mental health professionals, not replacing counselors. It's it's a tool that kids can use. And she she mentioned that a lot of the time, um, you know, they're just having a bad day. 
you know, what do, you know, I got in an argument with my mom, you know, and it kind of works, works through those smaller issues with the kids, gives them some strategies, you know, just kind of like a little counselor in your pocket, but not replacing a counselor, you know, um, so. I didn't know if like, if Casey Pyle every day is having a bad day and he's on there every mm -hmm. day talking to this AI, if the counselor's going to get some kind of alert saying, yeah. Casey's having a lot of bad days and maybe we need, do you understand? That's what I was yeah. wondering. Like if it just stays within the app or yeah. somehow our, our peeps get in yeah, there. Yeah, I think what I recall is that's like there's a report on the back end that's going to show like your students at this school had this many conversations about anxiety or had this many yeah. conversations about peer conflict. Um, so you're not going to get the details of the conversation, but you're going to get like the subject, the kind of like general subject of the conversation. Yeah. And if it's flagged as like a, a thing that needs to be followed up on, then the personal information of the student is going to be released. But I don't yeah. know that you're going to know per kid how many times they've reached out. Like I'm not, yeah. I don't know about that for sure. I I don't know either. And the, the bat, like I said, the back end with the report stuff, he went into a little bit, but we would, I think we would have to like have him present to be able to show we don't, I mean, more we're of just the program. Talking about this, so we don't know a lot about it, but I'm just curious without putting Leela on the spot is do you think, I mean, what do you, is this something that is a gimmick or do you think it would really be something a student would download and, and use? And that, I, I love that, and that was kind of my my thoughts whenever I was first presented with this too, um, was that you know they're the kids are searching right. We the sky's the limit on what they have access to, and so help, trying to kind of rein that in to where they do have something that we vet thoroughly that we know is going to give them accurate information um, and also alerts us when there's something more serious going on. So. Um, if you guys would like, I can, you know, look at like a like a full presentation um, with this moving forward. Um, you know, but I, I wanted today just to show you guys kind of what was out there and the way that technology is moving. So. so if the AI detects something more serious, it mm -hmm. alerts the school personnel. Yes. I'm curious how the software, how the company navigates both. Um, HIPAA and FERPA, because I feel like there's two things I have to consider, and I'm not sure if it should be an opt-in program instead of an opt-out program, mm -hmm. because of those cross sections. I'm not sure how it yeah. Um, I, I well, I don't think I. So I don't think a HIPAA there's a violation because there's no diagnoses that, that it sounds like yeah. it's giving. So I don't know that it's so much of a HIPAA. Um, FERPA, I mean, if, there, if there's an outcry, there are certain things about FERPA that don't apply because student safety is first. And it goes to the pre... We already have a similar system in Gaggle. You know, uh, we get email alerts when uh, a threat of harm to self or others is made. And so uh, we're able to uh, review what the threat is and who sent it. And so, and it goes to a core group of individuals um, identified either at, as the district threat assessment team or the campus threat assessment team so that we can react and respond. And like, we don't ever, like at the district level, I don't ever find out granular details about the student. It's more about the situation. And then that situation determines if we need to pull a group to conduct a full threat assessment. And that's where it gets granular. Um, and so uh, the courts have upheld that when it comes to student safety, that FERPA is protected 
but not to the extent that we can't do our jobs to be able to protect the student. I mean, we're not going out and, like, if I'm sitting on, if I go as a district staff member to support a campus and conducting a threat assessment, which we do, um, I'm not then telling that outside of that threat assessment team. You know, it's, it's stakeholders of that student that are coming together to determine what services the student needs now and ongoing so that we can create those set of wraparounds for that student. So I would envision, I don't know about alongside, I, I wasn't, um, I mean, I know of it, but I was not a part of the presentation mm -hmm. that was done. Um, and from what I recall, just walking through a vendor section, um, you know, at an exhibit hall, is that it's not, it's not asking for personal student information, you know. Um, it's capturing on the back end who that student is because there's, as a district, we've assigned the login and so it's tracking that way, but no additional information about the student is given. Um, and the alerts that go to predetermined people, I would envision it to be very similar to what we currently yeah. have. Like yeah. in our schools, outside of personal, like alerts go immediately whenever like vape detectors go off, you know, in a certain area of school, you have um, administrators that were already pre-identified to receive those alerts to respond to wherever that sensor was being detected. So we already do various levels of immediate response. Um, but I would assume that if they're sending us an alert, one, we're, we're going to protect uh, FERPA as much as possible um, in order to keep the safety of the student, but a system already exists in the district. I yeah. would assume that this would yeah. follow very similar to those protocols. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And she mentioned, too, that um, last year they had a lot more of those severe alerts than this year. Like yeah. they, they, we are seeing a decline, decline. In, those yeah. in, in students. And we are, and that's the I need guess. for immediate alerts, like yeah. imminent harm or high levels of harm. We are, yeah. we are seeing the trend going back down. Which is great news, great news. But so. we have other behavior trends, you know, that we yeah. need to address, so. <laughs> yeah. So, any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, physical health and nutrition, Miss Amy Bull. We do. We do. This year was the first year. I'm going to talk about that later. We have people here to talk about it, at least a person here to talk about it. But it's only mandated for this year's freshman class. So, um, yeah, for our students. <laughs> yeah, for our students who are already in high school, it's kind of hard to change their graduation plan because they're already on track. So I changed it with the incoming class. Mm -hmm.
Yes. In addition to PE. Yeah. All right, and for our next subcommittee, we have parent engagement, and I will be doing, so I'm gonna step over there. You gotta, you gotta get a feel for the podium. I'll grade you. Okay, I do not have a slideshow, PowerPoint, or anything. I just get to talk, so. Okay, so um, our subcommittee is on parent engagement, and uh, we met May, 13th, Casey, I, and Dr. Yeskis met via Teams. And these were our kind of things that we were going through. We were talking about how to improve parent-teacher communication. Um, there's kind of a lot of options. We talked about parent-teacher nights. Like, you know, we have open house, for those of you, like open house. And how successful are they really? Are there other ways we could be getting the parents engaged, especially parents. We pick one night of the year to have open house and how many of the parents have to work? They can't be there. They've got like a gaggle of kids with them because that's just, they didn't have a babysitter. So we were talking about ways to maybe um, change that, change the way the, if there's a large school-wide assembly part and then the like go meet the teacher part. And we talked about all of that um, possibly Let's see, have virtual parent guardian meetings since we have teams, maybe we could have virtual ones. So if a parent can't be there, we can still have an open time. The teacher can meet with the parents, possibly designating some of our half day PD days. Like when we have those, for those of you who don't know, we have half days. Uh, maybe having that, have some time where those are meeting times and parent teacher call times specifically. So teachers are given that allotted amount of time. Uh, we talked about the improved website. So if y'all don't know, CCISD changed their website recently. Um, and we talked about possibly move principal and AP info to the front page of the school website because it's kind of hidden on some school websites. I know ours isn't because Casey does ours. Um, but we thought about ways to improve the website to make it as user-friendly as possible for parents. Yes, and we did say, let's get, in t uh, get tech involved. Like, we want to ask from tech about all these things. We also know that there is an app. So raise your hand if you have the CCISD app. Okay, so the reason I bring this up is because we had a second meeting because we're extra. We had a second meeting this past Monday, Teams, and um, we met with one of our webmasters from CCISD, Jacqueline Flores, I believe. Frank, Frank yeah, that's the one, sorry. I remembered the F, okay. Um, we met with Jacqueline and she actually walked me through the app because I thought you had to be a parent to get it and I wasn't, I'm not a CCISD parent. And she walked me through it, we got it. And I said, I wonder how many people have this app or have downloaded it. She's gonna get the analytics for us. She's gonna find out. And she said, it's probably not as many as we want. We don't know that people really know, even though it's all over social media, by the way. They don't know, she doesn't know if parents really understand what the app is for, how to use it. And so that is kind of our big push right now. Because if you don't have that app, Students should have the app. You want to know what's for lunch? Go to the app. It's so easy to find. You want to know the events? Go to the app. You can do CCISD. You've got your school. If your kids are in six different schools, I don't know why they would be, but let's say that they are, you can have all of it on the app. It's so easy to use. And so I'm now an app promoter, apparently. I'm like, be on the app. But um, it really is pretty easy to use. But then there's the... The people who are not app savvy, they're not web savvy, they're not you know, technical savvy. So we talked about um, things that we could do as a district within our schools to help those people. Um, maybe when we have like fish camp, like we call it fish camp when the freshmen come, have like a parent camp and we have kids working with them to help them understand how to use the app. How do you go to Canvas? How do you check grades on home access? Like all the things that you can do. And we suggested having, okay, I suggested, like NHS kids and top kids show them because sometimes they're more techie and they can help the less techie people 
Lila knows, um, how to do that. And so uh, that was a lot of what we talked about, parent guardian info nights, um, ways to, oh, who will present? That was me, that was an easy thing. But that's kind of like our big thing. We, I said, parents can't be involved with the school if they can't even get involved with what their kid's doing because they don't have a, they don't understand the ways that they get involved with their kid. Once they're involved with their kid, the app, the school, the all the things, then they can get more involved with the school because they'll be like, oh, I can see all the events that are happening. I know what's happening. There's a hope symposium coming up, all the things, and they'd be able to see them. Um, also, I learned on that app, if there's an event, you just click, it'll add it to your calendar. Mm -hmm. That's so easy, I type them all in myself. And I'm like, wait, I could have been doing that all this time? So much easier. So um, anyway, are there any questions? We're trying to get parents involved, I promise you. We're engaging them as much as we can. And not all technology, but just knowing that these things are there. If you wanna know what your kids' grades are, we're gonna help you get there. And not we like me, because I can't help everybody, but. We're trying to get the ideas flowing. So do y'all have any questions? And thank you. What's her grade? She got 100. Oh, yay. She downloaded the app while she was talking. Oh, yay. Downloaded the app? Yay. I know they're having pizza. I told her I was going to ask everybody who had the app, and she said it won't be as many hands as you think. Mm -hmm. You have it now, Jason. Yay. Look at that. Cheese or pepper and pizza. I know. Okay. All right. So um, the next subcommittee is Student Employee Health, Veronica Sisk. <coughs> not being immunized, not being compliant with immunizations. Um, nobody was leaving their house. The last thing on anybody's mind was, let me get my child their childhood vaccines. So we wanted to look at kind of the problems occurring with that. We do have, this year, we're really seeing that there are a lot of students who need to catch up and catch up on those immunizations whether it's from clinics, whether it's just missing physician visits. Um, we did offer, in partnership with Amistad Community Health, some immunization clinics just last week in an effort to get the kids vaccinated before they hit seventh grade. They have a Tdap and meningitis vaccination that's due between sixth and seventh. And so we thought, let's be proactive and offer uh, some clinics to do that, and we were. We, are, we immunized about 28 students, which was really, really good. It was, um, But we wanted to look at how else can we do that. So we're still in the brainstorming process about offering clinics, what other resources, what other things can we do to really get parents engaged, to provide immunizations to the kids, um, and help them become compliant with what's state required. Um, we had an agency, a local health nonprofit agency here, that sent me a presentation and they asked if I would review it and could they possibly do a memorandum of understanding with the district and come in and present those things at PTA meetings. And so I looked at it, we vetted it during that meeting. Dr. Baggerman had a lot of suggestions and edits um, for that. So I sent those back to the agency to have them look at it, but he really wanted to include some things that are not state mandated. For instance, at least mentioning the HPV vaccine. So I don't know if you're familiar with that, the human papillomavirus vaccine, but it is most effective and males and females that take it between 11 and 12 years of age. 
It's not state mandated, not state required, but at least provide the information to our parents. So if we're gonna focus on PTA meetings, at least have that information available. So those were some of the examples of edits that we sent back to them. Um, that was pretty much the extent of our conversation. We did share on good things, and I'll share with you as well. In early May, um, at our transportation facility, we had an AED used on the campus that staff um, a bus driver went into cardiac arrest. He had just come back from dropping off kids on his route. The team did an amazing job. Uh, it was like textbook. They could have made their own heart saver video. Um, they went into action, grabbed the AED, called 911, stopped all the buses from coming in. He was in the parking lot and um, were able to, they had administered a shock. Um, 911 arrived, transported him to the hospital. He is, he is healing, he's getting much better. Um, he had a massive heart attack, but this team, because of you know the AED, the training, all that they had, they went in and textbook saved his life. So I just wanted to share that with you as a good thing that, that we're doing and that good was, things. Uh, were, were the people who, it, you know, implemented all of the um, emergency protocol. Were any of them medical personnel? None were medical personnel. So his assistant on the bus um, is the one that, you know, alerted everybody, called 911, grabbed the AED. She's the one that started it. There were three of them. And like I said, it was textbook, um, just like a little video, a heart saver video. Hey, you call 911 and you do this. And um, they applied the pads, they administered the shock as guided by that AED. Not one of them was an emergency or medical personnel. So good thing to Amazing. share. That's awesome. Can I just ask one quick question? Yes. I, I downloaded that app and I see on the calendar a happy health back to school health fair on July yes. 27th. Mm -hmm. Do we provide immunizations for those students that need to catch up so actually we will, and the health department is working on that. Um, I say that because Mr. <laughs> Gonzalez is here. Um, the health department is actually, it's, it's a joint effort between Driscoll Health Plan, um, CCISD, and LEAD First organization. And so we'll have that health fair. The health department will be there to immunize. We'll have CCISD nurses there to be able to pull up student records um, from our e-school system for kids in our district as to what may be needed in case parents forget to bring their shot records or don't have the information. So we'll be working hand in hand with them. It is open to any school district. And so hopefully other, you know, other school districts will take advantage of that too, but the health department will be immunizing. Um, and I believe it's no cost. So. That's fantastic. Good. Yes. Good. Thank I have a quick you. question. Sure. Um, how do you handle with vaccinations people who don't think their child should be vaccinated? So I'm not that person. I'm just asking how you handle yeah, yeah, it no, because I can't imagine question. being in a PTA meeting and someone just stand up and and, and that's a great that question. And parents absolutely yeah. have that right. So what happens is the state says, okay, if you have a medical reason or a reason of consciousness mm -hmm. that you don't agree with vaccines, you need a signed affidavit, and you can get that every. You have to do it every two years, but you go on to the Department of State Health Services website, and you download the form, fill it out, they mail it to you, you have somebody notarize it, and you turn it in. What does happen, I will tell you, if we have an outbreak, let's say somebody is not vaccinated against varicella, and we have an outbreak on the campus of chickenpox. Um, somebody has chickenpox, they're in the same classroom with, this, with Johnny, and Johnny's not vaccinated. We do, as nurses, have the ability to pull up who's not vaccinated, and we have to make a call and say, he's probably been exposed. So we want you to you know, be aware he's not vaccinated. We know that he's not, but a student had an outbreak in the classroom. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, like how that works so that, because I can't imagine people going off and I 
figured y'all have to have a, you have a system in place. We do. I didn't we, know what it was, so I was wondering. Uh-huh. We do. Okay. And, and, you know, we're seeing some breakthrough viruses. We are seeing, I will tell you this year, we're seeing some um, breakthrough from our unvaccinated, you know, and, and things that we felt like were eradicated. And so, you know, we've seen a lot more chicken pox. Um, and we'll see, we had a measles case. And so. so I teach biology, we teach about viruses. And I had chicken pox as a kid, you know, because back then we Me too. I'm pretty right. old. I didn't, we didn't have that. You know, I had right. it four times. Like, I feel like I'm four good. Times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right now. Good. Um, but when I ask, because I'll say, you know, y'all don't know what you, they're like, we know, like, there's always a random, you know, not a random, but at least maybe one, or I know someone, and I'm like, well, I have it, I have a scar on my forehead, you know, but Same. I just wondered, because now, of course, now I worry about what comes with having had the chicken pox, and then we right. talk about Well, we get shingles, right? The shingles, yes, I'm worried about this now, but, um, but I ask because when we talk about viruses, I never, met, and we talk about what vaccinations are, and da, da, da. But I never ask them, like, are you vaccinated? Because that's right. not my business to ask. But um, some of them will say things, well, my mom says, or, and I'm like, that's nice. And I just keep going. And, you <laughs> right. know, because it, it, that, that's why I wondered, like, how that kind of works. Right. And, and there are, I mean, it can be, like, you can get a lifetime medical, maybe a student that has a history of cancer. And the doctor can sign a form and say for the rest of their life they should not be immunized, you know. Um, we can get a lifetime for that. Otherwise, it's every two years if it's a religious or just a reason of consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's what it's called, yes. Yeah. No, I'm glad you asked. I have a quick question. A couple of years, maybe three years ago, the city vouchers is paying through our insurance risk management, uh -huh. but you can sign up, and um, I went through the whole thing, and I, it was extraordinary, and they talked about holistic health, right. and it was a, a medical doctor started it, and it, it delved into psychology, a sleep expert doctor, then they showed uh, somebody, like, the only way to really lose weight is by diet, and they showed versus exercise, you really could use it, you could support it, but not lose it. But then just, it, it was, they covered everything, and it was very, there were short videos, maybe 40, 45 minutes, uh, at, but it almost seems like it would marry up with a high school class for health, and it was done by experts. I know they paid for it, and I can't remember the name. I know it was, it was two words. It wasn't chicken pox. It was something else. <laughs> but uh, they changed the name of it, but they don't have it anymore at the city, but something like that. I just thought it rehired more of my brain, especially with the sleep deprivation, how much you need, like blue light filtering through your eyelids, Little things, but it was all done by experts, and it was all vetted. Uh -huh. And it seems like that that would be something you could just show in a classroom, test on it, and maybe give some reward at the end, you know, to besides just testing. Right. If you complete the class, you get something special. Uh -huh. I don't know. I just think it's worthwhile. It, it did affect the way I... Um, the way you viewed it and saw it. Yeah, it know. did. It kind of rehired my brain, to, especially with sleep. Uh -huh. And the fact that you just can't lose weight by you can exercise all you want, but if you eat all you want, you're not going to lose weight. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I just wonder. I just wonder if we can look at that. Yeah. It was extraordinary. Thank you. Good suggestion. Can you find the name? And yeah, I'll find out. out. I'll ask the city. Cause they didn't renew it, but they had it for, I think, two years in a row. And they did change the name. I just can't remember what it was. They start off the program by sending you a box. You get the box and you marry up with the first video. And there's a little nugget in there. It's not chocolate, but it's a, a, something. It's a little piece of, but they ask you to taste it. And um, you put it in your mouth, and they ask you not to chew it. And you savor it because you don't have taste buds in your stomach, right? That's my expert there. He, I go to him for everything. <laughs> and, uh, but he knows everything. He but does. I, I'm just saying that they, they tell you you have to chew your food slower to savor it, and you eat slower, and you digest it better, and you don't overfill yourself. They explain things so well that it rehardwired me. It just seems like something like that. It's canned. It's, it's good information. It's done by experts. Right. It would be worth the money to show in a health class. Right. Or maybe employee health. Right. It, it, yeah, absolutely. I don't see, I, I bet you any money that, well, I think the way that was paid for, maybe, I'm talking out of turn, but probably through risk and benefits and right. the uh, the insurance pool or whatever, mm -hmm. because it offsets if you have enough people sign in, but you have to have some incentive to do it. 
you know, it, and that's something we should mention to Deborah Barrera um, because I think that's a great idea. I'll they, get the name, and I, I'm sure it's still around. Okay. They just came up with a better name. I just don't. I just get, have a. I just can't remember. When you stop thinking about it, you'll remember. Yeah. That's the way it works. Any other questions? Thank you. Awesome, so that concludes all of our subcommittees. Um, we are now moving to the partnership with Driscoll Children's Hospital. Uh, Michelle Goodman? I'm not sure. No, it's oh. Shanae, yes. Um, well, I mean, I guess if they're your notes, uh, you know, y'all can tag team this together. Um, but yeah. yeah. So we have um, Shanae Womack, assisted by Lisa McKenna. Lisa McKenna, um, I'm the Director of Clinical Practice at Driscoll Children's Hospital, um, overseeing our mental health and uh, social work program. And so this program, do you do you want to start out? I, I guess I'll assist you, or? Uh. Well, I'm Shanae uh, Womack, so I, I'm the Behavioral Mental Health uh, RN at Driscoll Children's Hospital, and I just um, assist um, a little bit in this program, um, the program that we have, uh, or the partnership we have with CCISD um, and our mental health specialists in the schools. So I kind of want to introduce how this came about, though. In January 9th of 2023, we had an agreement, um, an MOU, um, memorandum of agreement with CCISD to establish a partnership between Driscoll and CCISD. So this was provided, the funds were provided um, by the Community Wellness Foundation, and Driscoll uh, Children's Hospital matched that for five mental health specialists. And then we had a private funder that came along and said, hey, let me fund another one. Um, so that's six schools. So we were probably able to provide uh, six mental health specialists in six schools. So that's about how it came about. Then we worked with CCISD on where to put them. We originally were looking for the middle school and high school, but they thought, hey, you know, we've got T-Chat um, for the high school and we've got community and schools um, for middle school. So if you guys wouldn't mind, you know, we really have a need in elementary. It wasn't our first choice, but we definitely have been making roots there. Um, so we're in five elementary schools, which include Morales Elementary, Shaw Elementary, Berlanga Elementary, Travis Elementary, did I say commonplace? Commonplace, and and then our high school is Moody High School. Um, so if you want to go ahead um, from there, so we can share that. Um, yeah. So um, we um, so what we do um, is we have our licensed clinical professionals. We do have one LCSW, which is our clinical social worker, and then the other people we have are either LPC, a licensed professional counselors, or a licensed professional counselor um, associate. Um, and so they're working their way to get fully licensed as an LPC. Um, and so they're supervised. Um, and so on average at, e at, at the campuses, we have 40 to 50 students um, at each school. Um, this includes individual sessions as well as group sessions um, that they partake in. Um, again, everything is done by uh, parent consent. So uh, we are referred to our, our uh, specialists through the counselor. Um, it's a campus-based referral. Um, out then they get consent from the parent. So you can guess that you want um, a Driscoll specialist to reach out um, and then kind of explain our program and what we do on the campus, which is provide psychotherapy. Um, and so once they agree to join in on the program, then our specialist will meet with them in an initial um, session and then kind of predefine from there. Um, we do, we, our focus is more short um, and so if something is more acute or something needs a longer term or needs a psychiatry involved, then we do refer out. Um, and so that is part of our process as well. So just, again, if our specialists don't feel like, hey, you know what, this is something more severe, then we can handle at this level, then we want to refer out and make those, uh, they make that communicated with the parents. Um, In addition to the students, we're there, uh, we're, primary, we're, associate, we're at that school. So that mental health specialist is there to provide for the entire school. 
not just the students, the parents, but also the employees to have an opportunity for the teachers to have a place to have someone to go and debrief with and talk with. Um, and so, and we are using um, evidence-based protocols. We're using the Triple P program, which is the Positive Parenting Program. And this is a program that is for family support, but also designed for early intervention for behavioral and emotional needs. As well as we do a, we are working with a program called the Unified Protocol. It's a form of cognitive behavioral therapy uh, that addresses anxiety, depression, and other related disorders. Um, and so that's kind of our evidence-based programs that we are utilizing and everybody that's trained in those. And again, teachers and staff, administration, anyone um, part of those six schools, there's no charge at all um, for any of these um, services. Um, we will start be accepting, we'll do insurance, but there will be no copay nor bill. So if we can recoup to become sustainable after three years, because our grant is only three years, that is it, but they will never receive a bill. And we will make that very clear to everyone. Yeah. Uh, a huge goal was accessibility, right? And um, we know there's a huge um, problem with mental health. And, and the best way to reach most kids in our community and their families is through our, our school district. Um, and so in saying all of that, um, up to date from August to now, we've had a total of um, 1,160. emotional support, follow-up appointments, group therapy appointments, um, mental health assessments, new patient um, sessions, and then also includes parent or family sessions as well. Um, and that's just since August. Yep, since August, since we've been able to document in our system. In our system, they are mental health professionals hired by Driscoll Children's Hospital employees. So they are within us, and then so they can able to operate that way and talk through our system and have the chart reviews to be able to review a history of their patients as well. Um, and what they will, so like she said, 1,168. Last year, we, we started January 9th with the MOU and hiring and getting them trained for the unified protocol as well as the triple P, took some time. We got into the schools, I want to say about March 20th after yeah. spring break. It took a little, you know, we've had to, you know, have iron space for them, things like that. But again, it's no cost to the school. But we, we had some bumps in the road. Then we tried out the recovery program and had some presence. Um, now they are year-round. So this year, we're, we're, we're open to ideas, too, so please let us know. But we will be present at the recovery schools, and Morales is one of them. Um, Collin Place is another one, um, as well as uh, Moody High School, where we will have someone already there. And what is the... Berlanga as well. And then actually we're partnering, so, and sorry about the summer school hours, but is it 8 to 1.30 or 8 to 1 on uh, Monday through Friday. Thursday? Yeah. Thanks. So what our plan is for them to be from there 8 to 1 to work with to do individual therapy when the time allows. We know that the students are there for recovery and that's their focus, but we've also been allowed to um, have those students that need to finish up transitioning who's had services and therapy throughout the year if needed to come there, but we are responsible for them being there and we take full responsibility of that. Um, and then at one at uh, two o'clock, we're partnering with two places. We're, on the, we're working towards it. Um, so if you want to speak to that. Yeah, and so we're working alongside
Um, in addition to that, you know, so and also on Fridays with No Summer School, we're, we plan to be present in the communities, whether it's at the Parks and Recreation uh, Program or at some of these areas. Some of these, we've partnered with some of the apartment complexes to um, do some things on Fridays with them, you know, whether it's sprinkles and popsicles and come meet out with the families and really engage with them and get kids outside. We really think that's important. Um, and to build up those relationships prior to them to entering into the school year. I do think, do you think at that point, I think maybe talking about some of our value, value, um, valuation measures, or you think we're ready for that, or do you have anything else? Um, no, does anybody uh -huh. have any questions here? Before? before we get to that, <laughs> any questions? So is, is the route teacher, see something going on, talk to the counselor, and the counselor is able to get the student in? Yeah, so anybody on the campus can really identify a student, hey, you know, I think there's something wrong. Maybe they know something went on at home. Maybe they know um, they had a family death, right, and they need their family grief support. Um, and if it's something that maybe the counselor can't provide at that tier one level, well, then they can definitely look for and let the parent know, hey, we have these resources. We actually have a, this first resource. I had a question, but it's more geared towards district personnel. So I know sometimes, because I'm not at one of the campuses that you guys are currently at, but I know you're seeing a lot of students. Um, and sometimes those students become referrals for special education. And I'm wondering, like, what I see is that we're lacking the documentation of supports they've been receiving in, in our documentation. Because I understand you guys have your own system that you're keeping, but when it comes time to, like, you know, recommend a student for an evaluation or for more specialized services, and we go back and look at the supports that they've given, that they've been receiving, we don't have any of that documentation that they've been receiving those supports. And we, so we recognize that and we're working with Triscoll to let them, and they know, right? So they know that we need it is for many reasons. Yeah. You're one, I mean, I have 504 students also being right. referred to 504 because they need protections for anxiety or mm -hmm. some of those, um, behavioral traits and so that's part of us working with them and being able to get those records so that we can turn them over to and do and live into our child find yeah. requirements. Yeah, that's a great great question, Erin. We want to all work together on the same and have multiple people working with the families and um, and we can provide that and as this grows we've got to work out the kinks and we are and uh, we're open to any feedback. So and I'll give you my card too if you have any feedback on that too. Cool. So, um, any other questions before we get to some of our evaluation measures? Okay, so some of the things, and granted, we've really been, I feel like we've been up and going since August, um, and so what we are working on is that we hope, and again, if you guys are looking for anything more, we're open to feedback and measurements, but we basically chose these schools based on a higher risk of harm to self and to others, and that's how it came about for the campuses. Um, so based on that, we're really hoping that we do see a decrease in self-harm to self and others. Um, attendance, um, leaving class, even if we're measuring, you know, Johnny left class, he didn't attend the whole period. Maybe we're working on getting Johnny to attend 15 minutes or 20 minutes or being able to redirect and bring him back and um, learning some calming techniques. So it might not be the whole period, but we're measuring increments of that so that they're not missing all of class. Um, so, um, leaving class, returning to class, coping skills, uh, teacher support, uh, parental involvement, um, and just uh, overall school success. Uh, you know, teacher retention rate, I think, is very important, too. We, we're trying more and more to be there to support the teachers and be in the lounges and let them know how much they're appreciated and having an opportunity to debrief with us and talk with us about things. Um, and go ahead. Yeah, so, um
that is part of, so we provide the salaries and everything else. So I did fail to mention that at each school, if we're going to be in them, they need to offer a private office with a locked cabinet um, drawer, left cap filing, sorry, <laughs> drawer, and, um, and we provide the rest with all our own IT, our computers, our uh, everything, um, whether it's snacks, appreciation gifts for teachers, luncheons, um, everything else were provided, all of our activities, and um, yeah, we provide it all. We just need a space and a locked filing cabinet. We're good? I think we're good. Thank you okay. so much for all your hard work. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Our last program update is from the high school health class, Miss Amy Bull. Okay, Leela, pay attention. So what you we had our first year of high school health, and we were able to serve over 2,000 students. And we have with us today one of our wonderful um, high school health teachers. I haven't used PowerPoint so long right here. Miss Kylie Taylor, who teaches high school, um, the health one at Carroll High School. And she'd like to give you an account of how it went for her this year. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. So it was a really exciting year because we got to really see um, where the wrinkles were in the classes. But first and foremost, I want to say that I'm very impressed that the district has included this class because I've noticed an outstanding difference in the students. Um, I think it's really helping with their critical thinking skills. They're able to debate and discuss openly with one another, not just with um, presentations. Um, I also really enjoy the textbook. I think it's a good foundation. I think it has a lot of really good information, specifically with the um, case studies. They're very specific to scenarios that our kids see every day, and I think they relate to them really well, so it's easier for them to um, do the assignments that are either individual or with a group. Um, inefficiencies was really just looking for more resources. As I said, I think the textbook was a good jumping off point but I think that we could have a hub on Canvas or something to incorporate more resources because especially at the high school level, they're very interested in testimonials, people they know maybe from media um, to incorporate in our lessons. So any videos, photos, um, maybe even, even films that could be shared in the class that they might be interested in, but of course that would have to be approved by the board. So maybe some kind of hub to share that information and then get that approved somehow would be great. Um, I did get information from Ms. Bull that we are gonna have textbooks brought back, which is great because um, the resources in certain schools, we don't have the technology. We only have about five Chromebooks per um, classroom for instruction. So I think it would be beneficial to get those textbooks back. She said they are coming back until we get that technology resources, which is great. Because um, like I said, I really do enjoy those case studies that those kids really enjoy. Um, they also have different assessments in the book that are great to have the kids take quizzes or fill out that the teacher can look at and see kind of where they're struggling most, whether that be in physical health, emotional health, or social health. I also really think it's great that it's starting with a heavier curriculum in ninth grade because they're going from eighth grade being top of the school to ninth grade, now they're back at the bottom and they're still like struggling with social anxiety, who are their friends, maybe some friends came from their old schools, maybe some didn't, so they're learning about communication. Um, you pointed out earlier um, that we have some issues with mutual combat and conflict between peers. I've seen a difference in my kids with um, their communication skills when we discuss the social health aspect of the class. I think that's a really good point to push in the health curriculum. Um, even if it means giving up a Fitness Friday to continue that lesson because they're really learning how to use coping uh, mechanisms, de-escalate situations, not just with their peers, but also with their, their teachers perhaps. Um, even at home with their siblings and with their parents, they can take those skills back home after they've left school. 
Um, they also really enjoyed the guest speakers that would come. And I think they're really integral to the curriculum because they're teaching from a professional standpoint a part of the content to those kids, but they're also teaching the teacher, the educator, more about that content. So it's even better because now you have another source from a professional, not just the textbook, to give those teachers uh, more information. Um, but we are pr prioritizing student health. I think this is a great asset to the district, and I've had really good feedback from parents, you know. So I think that overall it's been a very good, a very good uh, idea, and I think we should continue it. Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Taylor, for doing all the hard work in the classroom with the kids. Um, next, um, we have Christy Rutledge from Heritage Youth and Family Services of Texas to give us a report on um, the Heritage Keepers program that is used with our middle school, um, some updates on how that went this year. Good morning, Shaq. Um, just to give you all an update on Heritage Keepers, um, what is going forward, and what we did this year. Uh, it's important when we consider Heritage Keepers that we consider that it's an evidence-based program. So this is um, a huge benefit to the district. Uh, there's been three peer-reviewed studies um, reaffirming the effectiveness of Heritage Keepers. Our latest study in 2011 um, was of 2,200 students from uh, 41 different schools, middle and high schools. And the result is, is one year after taking the Heritage Keepers class, um, students reported initiating sexual activity a rate of one third of that of students who were not in our program. We think this is a huge benefit. So uh, we finally, um, we're at the end of our five-year grant, and we finally received, there's other, two other studies um, prior, but each one we get better and better. So we have some um, further evidence based on the, the reports of the, um, the re, um, not research, but the surveys that uh, CCIC students have done. So um, to date, there's been over $2 million um, funding for Heritage Keepers at no cost to Corpus Christi ISD. We're uh, finishing our eighth school year, and um, we had a goal last year to reach all middle schools, to have equitable offerings at your middle schools. So we achieved that this year, um, and we're finishing up, well, we will finish up today or yesterday at um, Tom Brown. So we did 11 middle schools this year, a uh, total of 1,140 students and 43 parents. Um, next year, uh, right now we're in grant writing season. Um, there's a potential of two grants um, that we are applying for, and if awarded, last year we discussed the possibility of expanding the program if funding became available. So if funding becomes available for both of these grants, it will be up to um, $1,050,000 per year, um, and we could provide this evidence-based program covering the health teaks for human sexuality, sex trafficking, child abuse, family violence, dating violence, character education for middle and high schools. That would be approximately six to seven full-time uh, certified Heritage Keepers educators dedicated to, for Corpus Christi ISD. Um, we think that's huge. So the potential to cover these subjects for high school if both grants are awarded. So these are the results this year. Remember, we're under opt-in, and we get better every year. This requires a lot of uh, coordination between um, the health or the PE coach. Uh, hopefully, the principal gets involved. Um, and so a lot of this information here is it, when you see lower numbers, it really relates to uh, the level of um, coordination. And, and we can talk about that later um, between the PE coach and and the student to get those uh, opt-ins back. Um, so this is how it breaks out. You can see at Caffey Middle School, this principal was really motivated, and uh, we developed a graphic that she sent out to um, parents that said, permission forms were sent home on this day, and this day is the date of the parent meetings. And so we developed that model 
I worked with Amy really closely this year. I've appreciated Amy very much. I'm going to miss you. <laughs> um, and, but uh, we've developed that model so that, uh, that there's a me mechanism for um, principals, vice principals, counselors, PE coaches to notify parents that there's a permission form. It was sent home and um, a schedule to do that three weeks in advance. Um, and how we, we go back and review those and make sure that they're in compliance. Um, so, and we got 18 parents. So that's great. Um, and all parents, I'm happy to say, were supportive um, of our program. Um, so this is the results of the program performance survey results. These are the surveys that you, uh, the SHAC uh, approved two years ago. It's a requirement of our state health department grant. And we think the results are great. So the, um, the likelihood not to use substances. So has uh, being in the program made you more likely or about the same or less likely? Um, you can see that we really increase uh, the likelihood that they would make decisions not to use drugs, um, alcohol, tobacco products, vapes, marijuana, use prescriptions without a doctor's. Um, likelihood to self-regulate and make good decisions. Has a program, uh, has being in the program made you more likely, or about the same likely, or, or, or less likely too? 75.5% um, more likely to re resist or say no to peer pressure. This is one of the predictors of teen sexual behavior that we address in delivering the curriculum. 65% um, more likely to manage emotions. 71.6% uh, more likely to think about the consequences. Um, going on, likelihood of goal setting has being in the program made you more likely or about the same or less likely. 80.6% uh, <clears throat> say they're more likely to care about doing well in school. 81.6% say they're more likely to make plans to reach their goals. Future orientation is one of the predictors of uh, teen sexual behavior that we address throughout the curriculum. What do you want for your future? How would being involved with risky um, behaviors, adolescent risk behaviors, affect your future, your future family? And so you can see it really comes through. And it comes through in them saying, look, we're thinking about it and we're gonna resist. We're gonna resist peer pressure. Likelihood of knowledge about healthy relationships. 83.3 more likely to better understand what makes a healthy relationship. Likelihood to refuse unwanted sex. 75.5% um, more likely to resist or say no to someone um, if they're under pressure. Uh, so these are the actual survey questions and the results. Likelihood to communicate about healthy relationships, 76.7% more likely to talk to a trusted adult if someone makes you feel uncomfortable or hurts you. So we do address uh, child abuse um, and um, that uh, legislative requirement for the district to deliver that in an effective way. Uh, likelihood of behavioral intentions. This is our ultimate goal. We want students to change their behavior, to um, make a decision be intentional about re, um, avoiding risk-taking behaviors. So 73.1% more likely to plan to delay having sexual intercourse until you graduate. 76.6% more likely plan to delay having sexual intercourse until you graduate college or another education program. 72.6% more likely to plan to delay having sexual intercourse until you are married. And 80.8%. 80.8% more likely plan to be married before having a child. 85.5% um, more likely plan to have a steady full-time job before having a child. This is the success sequence uh, that we teach. Um, and it basically says um, you can eliminate poverty by about 97% if you get your education, get married before having uh, I get a full-time job uh, before having a child. And the, it, it, it's an eliminator of poverty. So you can see it's coming through. The kids are responding to it. Um, the experiences in the program, this is their perception, how they felt about our delivery. Um, we think this is great. Um, they felt respected, 
88.7% of the time. Uh, and 86.5%, um, they felt like they could have discussions and they liked the activities. Um, and they felt the material was presented very clear, 88.1% of the time. And they were interested in the program um, at high rates. So what I'd like to present to you is some other things. There's advantages to having heritage keepers in, um, in your health program, in your middle school and your high school health program. And the advantages are that we get results. That's what we do. Um, we are here to help your students uh, have healthier lives. And hopefully, they have healthier children, healthier marriages, and they return to you in a, a decade or whenever they become parents, healthier children that they may have. Because most of them are probably going to become parents. So we have three different op options for, or two different options for Heritage Keepers. This is the one that's currently approved for ninth, uh, sixth through twelfth grade. Okay, um, and re our research levels show that if students receive um, Heritage Keepers twice, one Heritage Keepers one, which is what you already have approved and have had approved since 2015, um, if they receive this twice before having Heritage Keepers two, which is for ninth through 12th grade, um, that it just increases. All of this will just increase. We're reinforcing as they're growing, as they're developing more experiences, more pressures, more information is coming um, in their arena, right? Um, whatever that is, social media, their family, uh, as they develop relationships, their peer groups, things like this. So I would, I would like to have direction from the SHAC, uh, from the school administration. What would you like um, for us to do? Should we get funded with two grants? A million dollars is a lot of money to bring the district. That's a huge benefit to you. But the biggest benefit is the health of your children and that they want to do better in school, that they want to avoid risk-taking behaviors like drugs, alcohol, vaping, that they want to avoid uh, the risk of sexual activity, um, and they want to have healthy relationships. They understand those concepts. So Heritage Keepers 2 um, is an option for you to review next year. Um, I've never presented it because I haven't had the opportunity, so you'd have to put it on the shack and go through the legislative requirements for that. The benefit, I've kind of flagged some subject areas here, and I think Amy has all of these for the shack if you want to review them. Um, it goes a lot deeper into um, things that um, uh, Mr. Shower was asking about, like the date rape drug, specific drugs, uh, relationships, goal setting, um, marriage, and it's more age appropriate for high school, so it expands on it. So assuming that middle school students had the curriculum in sixth grade and seventh grade, that we increase these numbers of opt-in, and then, uh, and then um, that's twice, and then this in ninth grade, as we continue um, teaching in the district, you're just gonna have healthier students, and they're gonna be more able to um, communicate my alarm. They're going to be more able to communicate um, what their values are, what their goals are, um, and uh, how they want to carry themselves in their current relationships, but in their future relationships. Another curriculum is um, based on Angela Duckworth's um, grit, um, understanding what makes resilience. So this is an option. I just need to hear from you all, what should I build into my grant application? I have um, one pending for our current uh, grant, which is the State Health Department for middle schools. Um, and then I'll have a second one that I'll be um, submitting in June. And I can submit that for middle school, high school. I can say, look, potential of all of these. These are five-year grants, right? Um, and so that's a long time. But once that option passes up, it's gone. So I just need to hear, like, what do you want? And uh, the benefit for us teaching in high schools is, one, evidence-based, and two, it just relieves um, the burden on the district to have um, trained uh, human sexuality educators, right? Um, we, we bring that training for you. We have a long history, uh, successful history with the district. We bring good results for your students. It's an evidence-based curriculum. Um, so. It's just an option for you to do that um, and, and just tell me uh, what, do you, what is your vision for your high school health program 
and your middle school program. Because certainly we can just continue in middle school if we're funded. If we get two, two grants, then um, we could expand to high school, which is something that we had been looking at. Um, so uh, there's that. And uh, so that's basically what I just went over, that this is the reinforcement in Heritage Keepers too, and that's the ninth through 12th grade. It's not approved yet. Put it, I mean, if you want it, we can put it on the shack in the future. Um, and again, any questions, um, I'm always open for them. And we've just appreciated the partnership with Corpus Christi ISD. We're in the process of renewing our MOU. Um, and we love to see uh, that high schools remain in our MOU, because uh, we've had now an eight-year agreement for middle and high school, which is the curriculum that's currently approved. That's approved for, we could certainly just teach this again, but then that would be three times, potentially, that students would receive it um, if we taught in high schools too. So that was the reason that I, um, I recommended if, if we expand to high school, that you consider this next school year. Um, and then I just get clear direction on what your goals are. And if you think this is a good, good option, I'm happy to come back and present that individually. Um, any questions? Yes. So you mentioned that you're currently have a MOU, I think is what you said for, for middle school and high school, but you said you did 11 middle schools this year. So did you do any high schools at all this year or just no. those 11 middle schools? Because we're limited to uh, our funding. Sure. And, um, and so that was the discussion last year when I presented to Shaq is with our current grant, if you want equity in middle schools, it used to just be by invitation. Um, we taught mostly in high schools prior to the opt-in requirement. We taught the bulk, because high school PE coaches want to have us there. They like the fact that they, we teach, they sit, they do their plans for their sports, but they also like that they don't have to be trained to do this. You know, um, now that you have the health curriculum, um, we could just teach through the health class. But the, the point is, is that the direction last year was, you have this much funding, to hire this many teachers and let's be equitable um, for all middle schools. And so we made that happen. It was, it was pretty difficult. <laughs> um, but just because we, uh, our funding will increase under that grant if it's, if it's awarded next, uh, it, we'll know by the end of September or August, so. Um, Good job getting all 11 schools, middle schools. And I mean, if there's room, in the high school health curriculum for, is it a week long that the No, it's a, it's a, so weeks. Heritage Keepers um, 2. Two weeks. Which is the ninth through 12th grade that you'd have to review and approve and go through board. It's really um, reinforcement and expansion of the same concepts for the high school level. Um, it is a little bit longer. It's at least one day longer, but it's easier in a set classroom like health because you don't have some of the logistical problems when you're gonna get a full 50, 52 minutes worth of teaching in because there's a room available. They don't have to be brought over from the PE, you know, from the gym after attendance. We're gonna get more, and, and so it's, we don't have the logistical issues of having to locate a space um, and move students. It's basically 12 days or 13 days, okay? Um, some, we've had to teach it sh in shorter amount of time. We could expand it to three weeks. Um, I mean, if you approved Get Grit or Quit, um, I think this is a great program. I, I love it because it talks about resiliency and we all need to know. And it's, it's uh, eight elements, um, eight essential elements of success. So um, what we could go three weeks or whatever. So it's just really up to the shack. What do you want? So it's a character education, right? What do you want? It's another thing to review, you know, put on the schedule. This is, I don't think, has to go through board approval because I don't think it's human sexuality, okay? Um, it's character. So it's, it's up to you all to, to decide, but the potential is that we could be in the, in the um, health class, and I understand most of them are um, coaches, and so they would benefit from being able to do their coaching work while we teach. They just have to be in the room with us um, because we don't teach without a CCISD employee in the room with us. 
And for clarification, I don't know that it's Shaq's responsibility on determining what curriculum we will use in the class, other than once the district has identified, then y'all would have to approve it. Um, kind of like what we did with the textbook. So the district did the research on all of the resources for the textbook, um, right, consulted the state adoption and um, you know those on the list, and then brought forth a recommendation uh, for it. And um, we, in working with Ms. Rutledge last year, she's right, in prior years for this curriculum, um, it was whoever signed up for it. Right. Uh, it wasn't mandated at any grade band of campuses. And so um, in working with her, I did say I want every single middle school mm -hmm. to have this curriculum. Um, and so that's where work, I think it's been two years. Has it been two years? It's been two, two school years. years. We've, yeah. uh, we've tried to achieve that. And really you started off with yeah. us because that opt-in was sort of scary. Yeah. Big boogie man. Yeah. And um, About halfway uh, I don't, through, I think that first year. It's expiring in August, but I think we can look forward to it continuing. I think mm -hmm. there'll be some movement to make that continue. So I don't think we can ever say to ourselves, right. opt-in is going away. Right, agreed. Um, <laughs> They right. recently did it to something, not this, but right. where they extended what did expire, they went ahead and extended it, the commissioner did. So I anticipate something similar for this. Right. Because, you know, we do want to make sure parents are aware that their students going to receive this instruction and we do our job in educating our parents about it. Um, and so I know uh, Ms. Bull has been working with Ms. Rutledge along with our high school health teachers. Um, who are currently teaching all of the content, and we do uh, provide supplements through guest speakers, either in-house guest speakers like our social workers or counselors, or even outside, say the council comes in and provides any type of drug information and training. Um, you know, our health class is one semester long, it's not a full year, and so we have to balance also the, the length of time of the curriculum delivered versus, because if you offer health by law, I must teach all the teaks in health. So we've, you know, our scope and sequence um, and just our pacing guides for being able to cover that content is, is important as well. Could there be a fentanyl component? Because uh, fentanyl is in everything, you know? I, I think we do, um, we can, so we are the curriculum developer. If you tell us what you want in here, we'll put it. Well, fentanyl is because this, this any is, kind of drug, so yeah. you know, some component about the dangers of fentanyl. So if there's something that you want, you want an, um, a solid definition of, um, you want it to be emphasized, you see a problem in your community, we will add this and, and print the books based on what you give us as your feedback, all right? Um, I, I don't have as much flexibility with our Heritage Keepers One since this is the... Um, on the HHS evidence-based list, um, US HHS, but this one uh, is not the one that had the research. It's reinforcement of two. So this is Heritage Keepers Two. It's re reinforcement of the first. Which grant are you applying for? Is that state or federal grant? Or the, um, both. So it's the Sexual Risk Avoidance Education Grant. It's a uh, Social Security Act. Um, it's a special line of funding. Um, the federal government uh, has and one part of it goes to the state to distribute to contractors, and they'll be distributing to 20 contractors in the state of Texas, and that's the grant we have currently, um, and that we have had for the last eight years. And the second one that um, I'm applying for is directly to the federal government, um, and they'll be distributing around 30 grants. That's the Department of Health? Um, it's the Office of Population Affairs or Federal Youth Service Bureaus. They have all these, you know, this department slash this department and then this department and yes. So there's a lot of different ones, but yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's HHS, and, basically. And we do, um, as you know, we're required, well, I don't know if you know, I've, we've presented here before, we are required as a school district to um, provide direct instruction to all students regarding fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And we incorporate other drugs into that as well. Um, and through uh, our counselors, I don't know if you want to talk, either one of you, because we do multiple times throughout the year, even though we're only required to do it once, we have an ongoing education. Let me see if it's in here. Okay. That's what it is. <laughs>
Yeah, it's a state required curriculum that we must give uh, through the Texas School Safety Center. Uh, to answer your question, there's four pages in here with uh, definitions on alcohol and drugs, and we do infuse our predictors of risk avoidance, but we can just add a definition for fentanyl. I don't see it in here, but the first one is the one you asked about last year, and that's uh, the ro rohypanol? Yeah, yeah, roofies. Yeah, that's what you asked about last year, the date rate drug. So, um, so it's actually, when I saw our heritage keepers too, I hadn't looked at it in a long time, um, I was pretty excited to see some of the things that you all were asking for. I'd love to teach this to high school students because it really expands on some things that they're really facing. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you yeah, talk yeah. to the microphone? Oops. Sorry. Um, I was looking at the data, and you said most of it is service or survey-based, right? Um, it's, the, it's the post-surveys that the students take after they finish our curriculum. Perfect. And so it's was, from, straight from the students. And I was wondering, um, so do you have statistics on Nueces County, like if the teen pregnancy has gone down too? I, I do. Oh, uh, awesome. I, I do. Uh, I offered that last year. I didn't include it this year. So there's two different. Um, I have to calculate the teen pregnancy rate um, because that's not a data um, a data point that the state health department offers, um, and I have to derive that. But if you're looking at teen birth rates, it's gone down significantly since Heritage Keepers started teaching. Uh, it went down 18% uh, in the first year and a half that we taught. Um, and so now I think it's uh, something over 250 less uh, births per year um, than when we first started. That's big. That's a big savings to the district and to um, society as a whole, just the health of the mother and the child and the father and everything. Um, but regarding... Um, teen pregnancy, I don't have that on hand, um, but it, so tw what I can tell off the top of my head um, is that in uh, 2020, uh, it went down significantly because uh, the students weren't in school. In 2021, they started to come back to school and it started to come up. And 2022, uh, no, I'm sorry, 2023, the um, teen birth rates uh, spiked again. So it's con it's gone down significantly in Oasis County, but it's going back up because the students that came back to school after COVID started to engage in sexual activity. We're not reaching the older students with evidence-based curriculum. That's the difference in Heritage Keepers and what you're currently doing. Is, is it proven effective to change behavior? And so uh, your teen pregnancy rate, our teen birth rates are going up in 23. Um, I think it was like it went up 15% uh, because those, those, no, those births are going to happen, you know, about nine or 10 months after they get back into school and in their social environments. So does that make sense? But if you, if you all want more solid data, I'll definitely get, make that for you. else? Thank you so much. I, you. I appreciate the partnership. Thank you. Ms. Bull, is that that? Yes. Yeah. So we're good? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Do we have any public comment? I haven't received any public comment requests. Okay. We're good. We have a, somebody who didn't speak that's sitting out there. And I'm just making sure. Okay. All right, um, so we do have a few announcements. There are going to be some shack board vacancies. Um, Ms. Harris Mendy, did you mm -hmm. want, Dr. Harris Mendy, did you want to talk about it? I mean, we have the list. Yes, you'll have the list in your uh, packet. If you're on the list. If you're on the list, <laughs> um, your term expiring in 2024, um, then if you're not interested in reapplying, uh, my definitely want to uh, thank you for your service to us. Um, it's been wonderful and invaluable. Um, however, if you are interested, the application is online mm -hmm. um, on our district website. We are also promoting it on social media. The district is sending out a notification on social media. 
and uh, we encourage you to apply. It closes May 31st for anybody who's interested. That's next week. Yes, it is next week. Um, the last day and then Leela is leaving us because she's graduating. I know. She's, uh, it's been three years. I can't believe that. So um, it's been amazing and uh, so helpful. And I get to... I get to work with uh, Leila in, in many avenues. She's such a dynamic young lady. I look forward to what you're going to do, but you better come back and do it here. <laughs> Leila, where are you going to school? Um, and what are you studying? Uh, I'm doing a program where I'm getting a uh, bachelor's in science in engineering, and then my master's in engineering, and then my MBA. Yes. Talk about goal setting. I know. Already set for it. Yeah, she's she's uh, pretty dynamic, um, and her position will be replaced. But it's not through the application process. Her position is actually named through the board of trustees, so they will be naming uh, her replacement through the board of trustees. Not that we wouldn't consider if anybody wants to apply. It's just board of trustees for all positions, but generally they appoint uh, our student. Okay. Any questions? Does anyone have any questions about if you want to continue, what you need to do? Okay. All right. So it is 11.09, and I don't know, Ms. Dr. Many, do you have any other closing, not closing arguments, closing okay. comments? <laughs> no. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. It's the end of the year. It is the end of the year, and yeah. so uh, this is our last scheduled meeting. Um, I don't anticipate needing to call another meeting. Uh, we will have some items. Uh, so once we um, install um, our new termed individuals, um, we will have the onboarding like I usually do for training, and then we'll have back-to-back -back meetings at the beginning of the year. I do have a situation Right now, I, I'm not sure which way it's going, uh, but Del Mar College, we have students who attend Del Mar College through branch high school or collegiate, and so their courses are actually taken through the university. Mm -hmm. So health for those students, um, for the incoming freshmen, they didn't take it their freshman year, which is fine, they just have to take it before they graduate. Um, but we've been working with those campuses and Del Mar because, Normally, Del Mar selects their own books, and they don't go through our process such as this, um, and Del Mar was needing to find, um, you know, uh, individuals on their campus, professors on their campus who was willing to work with us because they don't normally work with parents either. And so since right. we have to have opt-in for this content, it, it took some um, working through the university to help us identify a professor who would work with us. Uh, and now we're trying to work through the resource, the instructional resource that they would use on campus, i.e. the book. Um, and so um, we, our recommendation to Del Mar was to use the book that's already been uh, approved through y'all and through our board. Uh, but that decision hasn't been made. So if they change books and want us to use their book, then I would need to bring that resource through the process. So two public comments here, then going to our school board for final approval. But that would create a situation of back-to-back -back meetings at the early in the year uh, because they need to start using start. that book and teaching the content. Would that be considered dual credit? It is dual credit. It is dual credit, is. right? Mm -hmm but they would still have to go through the process. Yes, and, I, and we contacted TEA yeah, to help different. us with that um, because I also have a situation that, you know, just came up where somebody wants to take it through correspondence, and I, you know, I need to work out those kinks as well uh, just for clarification on what the, our role is as SHAC and a school district, uh, but we did get final guidance from TEA that, even dual credit courses need to come through uh, SHAC if we're going to talk about any of those five okay. topics. Correct. Okay. So, because they would need to know about the book before they start teaching, correct? And we've been we we've been working with them trying to. <laughs> I've been working looking through. I've, I've been looking through the resource over the past week, um, and my understanding is that they only have the two approved here.
yeah, no, it makes sense to me. If it seems like it'd be easier for them just to hear, just do this. But yeah, no, I understand. Can other schools, if this ends up, can other schools decide to do health dual credit? No. It's only crosswalked with uh, it's crosswalk. okay. yes, through branch and collegiate only. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I figured, but you know, someone's gonna ask because someone here. Absolutely, and that's, hear it, that absolutely, and that's where and that's where the, the topic of correspondence course came up, you know, as well. Um, right. Because we have several students who try to accelerate through credits in middle school mm -hmm. or early in high school, and this is one of the classes. And I understand the desire to, but I also understand the bigger message that we need to get out to our students. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, completing the content's important, but I think the knowledge and experience of um, some of these topics. I mean, you heard um, Ms. Taylor, uh, Ms. Taylor like the talk about, yes, had. you know, just those skills and, um, right. you know, you get so much more through conversation than, you know, a book study. Because my students had Miss Taylor. They I'm talking. wondering who's running Carroll High School right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. No, they they t would tell me about things, and they're all not personal things, but like, oh, we had this discussion, or we were doing this, and they were mm -hmm. always telling me stuff. So, yeah, yeah. So it's really good. Okay. So I can I anticipate that you know but if we don't get our book, our our district book to be utilized at Del Mar, then I, I know guess. for sure that's a topic. And then we also have a topic of human trafficking. So uh, there's, the state is really wanting us to expand on human trafficking and, and use you know, specific partnerships. And because of that topic, we would need to bring that through. So we're program. talking like twice in August or in August, September? Probably in August, September. August, September. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm gonna work to try to identify the best dates. Um, Plus the training meeting, but that's usually for new. Yes, the new people. It's we open it up to everybody, but it's really yeah. I'm targeting the the new folks. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I have no other comments for y'all. It is 11:15. Please enjoy the rest of your day, and for most of us, happy summer! Yay! <laughs> well, for all of us, happy summer.